welcome to this talk, How to Not to Strangle Your Coworkers. Um, this is me, I'm Arthur, or Art, take your pick. I am a software developer. I am not a uh, psychologist, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a brain-related person of any kind, except a hobbyist. I love learning about brains. I love learning about what we're finding out about how they work from psychology and neurology and taking those things and applying them to figure out how we can be better coworkers for each other, how to build better software together and how to make a better world for each other. I work at Avature, which is in Omaha, Nebraska, which is exciting that I get to say it and people are like, oh, I know where that is. Usually people ask me like, where do you come from? And I'm like, Omaha and they're like, I drove through that once, unless they're from Europe, in which case they go, I have no idea where that is. Which point I go, it's in the middle of the country, you put your finger here and you just go up a little bit. That's where I come from. And then they're like, okay, so how far away is that from Kansas City? And I'm like, three hours. They're like, oh my God, no. Um, so Aventure lets me come do cool things like this. We're a custom development shop. Um, we do software for basically lots of different people. Um, I've been there for nine and a half years. It's a really exciting place to work. We have a booth here. You should come drop by and see it. So let's start out with everybody's favorite, a quiz. How many of you think that you've been in conflict with a coworker? Raise your hand. Okay, well, let's start off by defining some terms. Let's decide about what their difference rather between conflict and disagreement. So a disagreement in the terms I'm using is two or more people who have differing or opposing opinions or beliefs about something at work, all right? That's a work-related disagreement. Now that's pretty broad. A conflict differs from a disagreement and it becomes a conflict when three things are true. First, when it's important or when somebody believes it's important when it comes to things like tabs versus spaces. <laughs> Both parties have to believe this is an important thing. Otherwise, what would become a conflict just kind of peters out and dies. The two people have to be interdependent with each other, which is to say that their outcomes have to be interrelated. You have to succeed with that person or fail with that person. And their behavior has to influence whether you succeed or fail. And thirdly, you both have to believe that the evidence is on your side, what's called evidentiary skew in the literature. This is when a disagreement starts to become a conflict. When it's important, you both have to work together to do a thing and you both think you're right. So with that definition, how many of you think you've been in a conflict with a coworker? About the same number of hands. A lot of the things that we do actually engage in conflict with are important and they do matter. But conflict kind of sucks. I mean, like really sucks. And we tend to avoid it. We're usually afraid of conflict. In fact, we as humans are so afraid of conflict that we do this thing called defensive avoidance, where we turn around and downplay, minimize, and ignore conflict as much as humanly possible, just to not have to deal with it whenever we can manage. And that's unfortunate because conflict is freaking everywhere. If you put seven engineers in a room, you have 12 opinions. <laughs> and we can benefit from conflict. Conflict can be beneficial. It can help your project. It can help you become better. Now, luckily for us, psychology has us covered. I'm sure it's not a shock for you to realize that humans have been in conflict with each other for a very long time. And we've done a bunch of research, especially recently, on the psychological underpinnings of conflict. So today, we're gonna to talk about task process and relationship conflict. And then we're gonna talk about psychological safety as a groundwork for good conflict. We're gonna talk about how to deal with your emotions during conflict, and then we're gonna talk about confrontational styles. And lastly, we're gonna deal with conflict as an individual contributor and how you individually can do things. So let's talk about task conflict, process conflict, and relationship conflict. Now these are three different types of conflicts that you can break most conflicts into. Task conflict can come, or comes rather, from disagreements about what you are doing the work you are doing, how you are performing that work, what framework we're using, what language we're using, all of the things about how you're doing it, what patterns, practices, the DevOps stack, all of that nonsense. And it just 
these days you've got so much to think about. Task conflict is actually pretty good because task conflict can help you find new ideas. It can help you discover new ways of doing things, solve problems creatively in new ways. And it can help you subtly identify ways to deliver value. And it can help you identify risks in your proposed solutions too. Task conflict is pretty unilaterally good. There's also process conflict. Process conflict is conflict coming from disagreements about how you do the work. What is the, have the methodology we're using? Is it Scrum? Is it some other form of Agile? Is it Waterfall? Who's in charge? What are the goals of this product? How do we decide as a team what's going to happen? And process conflict starts out pretty good because when you're spinning up a team, when you're starting out a project, when you're engaging in work for the first time, you have to figure all of these things out. None of these rules are written for us. You have to engage in that process of figuring out how you're gonna do the work you're supposed to do. It can help you figure out new ways of working, help you solidify your team's values. It can even help you figure out if you have the right people on the team. But after a certain point, process conflict actually becomes toxic. And the reason for that is eventually you have to get the work done. And if you're still arguing about how you're getting the work done, you're not getting the work done. Process conflict after a certain point actually indicates that someone on the team feels that there's an unfair allocation of resources or that there's some kind of process hiccup that is causing them additional pain, that there's some kind of inequity that they're dealing with. And process conflict isn't just about individuals either. It can actually be driven by system stuff two teams that are in conflict with each other because of the way you set up your organization or because of the way you're deploying your software, or because of you're pitting one team against another if you have a big monolithic dev team and a monolithic QA team. The last kind of conflict is relationship conflict. Conflict can come from disagreements about who we do the work with. This can be caused by personal dislike. It can be caused by power seeking behaviors. It'd be caused by just distaste. And this is the conflict that we hate, that we avoid at all possible costs. This is conflict that is awful and it's squamous and it's terrible and it starts bad and it just gets worse. And we want to avoid it at all costs, which causes us to actually ignore most of the rest of conflict. And conflict doesn't just have to come from inside your team either. Process conflict in particular can arise because of those interactions between teams. Resource fairness, misallocation of, you, uh, of people, roles and responsibility clashes, misaligned priorities, a team that cares a lot about keeping things stable versus a team that cares a lot about experimenting. That's a conflict brewing. You just set it up. Doesn't matter who you have on those teams. So how do we minimize bad conflict and maximize good conflict? Well, if you've been to one of my talks before, uh, I don't ever have easy answers for you. I'm sorry, but you know, that's kind of my brand at this point. <laughs> like all good magic tricks, if you want to pull out good conflict from a team and minimize that bad conflict, most of the work happens well before you think that conflict starts. So we have to talk about psychological safety. I don't think it's a stretch to say that a human being is a social animal, right? We have all of these relationships with each other and with other people. And we have kind of this internal innate sense of how strong those relationships are and whether they're positive or negative. We basically maintain that almost autonomously. So part of the reason that we're actually risk averse when it comes to conflict is that we want to protect those relationships because even at work, those relationships matter. Who you interact with, who you can influence, who you share opinions with, all of those things matter at work and they can be affected by the strength of those relationships. We want to avoid damage to those relationships. And so we manage risk to them unconsciously without thinking about it, 
Our autonomous brain leaps forward and protects us, holds back our actual opinions, holds back our thoughts, and basically replaces them with meaningless nonsense. Things that we think won't offend. This is a lack of psychological safety. Psychological safety is a description of a climate, an environment where people feel safe enough to share their thoughts and opinions and feelings, even if that might have a risk to their social structure, their social relationships. They want to speak up and share what they have to offer, and they feel like they can do it because they won't suffer that damage. Amy Edmondson, who's done a ton of research on uh, psychological safety, describes it as a climate, as an environment, right? As this in thing that you walk into. And psychological safety isn't just about being nice, okay? It's not about just playing nice and saying nice things because frankly, toxic positivity is just as bad as toxic negativity, especially when it comes to teams. And it isn't just a personality factor either. It's not that one person is more likely to be psychologically safe in a team than another. This isn't something you're bringing to the table. This is something created in that group environment. And it isn't simply the same thing as trust, although trust is definitely an important component of psychological safety. I tend to think of it as you give trust to your team and you receive psychological safety in return. Okay, so that's what it is. Now, why do you want it? Well, teams without psychological safety hold back, even when what they have to say could be catastrophically important for the group, for their customer, for their organization, even for themselves. They will hold back that opinion. Teams with psychological safety prevent catastrophic failures. Amy Edmondson, again, who I'm citing a whole bunch here, uh, a bunch of her research was about hospital settings teams of nurses and doctors preventing catastrophic outcomes for patients because they have psychological safety, because the nurse feels confident to step up and say, hey, wait a minute, doctor, is that the right dosage of that? Because you've been up for 14 hours and I'm not sure. Psychological safety helps increase those two magical things that everybody seems to want, team performance and team engagement. Like if you're looking for a way to actually increase engagement that's not mandatory fun nonsense, this is one of the ways. Have a psychologically safe team. Psychological safety allows you to find hidden conflict in your teams and surface it. Conflict already exists in your teams, all right? You already have people that you are in conflict with or they're in conflict with you and maybe you don't even know it. Psychological safety allows you to find those things, to surface them, to bring them to light and have discussions about them. Because those things are already driving your team's interactions. So, great, how do you get it? Well, okay. What sucks is that you can't do this at an organizational level. You can't just as a CTO, as a engineering lead, as somebody just go, yeah, we're all psychologically safe now, great. Give them the sanctus domini and they're done. It doesn't work that way. It has to be established at the interpersonal level because it's about those interpersonal relationships. Like Edmondson says, this is a climate and your environment can have a bunch of microclimates. One team at your company could be psychologically safe and another could not. All you can do is kind of prepare the overall environment so that psychological safety emerges. It's like gardening. And a lot like gardening and a lot like magic, you have to prepare long before it's needed. So Edmondson has written a book, The Fearless Organization. I'd really recommend it. Um, she goes through and builds out a whole toolkit for how to build psychological safety in teams. She has, it's literally this. Um, we're not gonna go through all that today. I really ought to just do a whole talk on psychological safety, but this is a lot. So we're gonna pull out a couple things to talk about that I think are the most important. We're gonna talk about demonstrating situational humility, practicing inquiry and expressing appreciation. So let's talk about situational humility. Nobody really wants to participate with you if you just pretend like you know everything all the time. You wanna adopt a learning mindset, a humble mindset. Edmondson describes this as situational humility, which is to say that the need for humility lies in the situation. 
The situation is such that you need to be humble because you don't know the answer. You don't know the outcomes. You don't know the, the unknowns, right? The unknown unknowns and the Sinophon framework, right? You want to err on the side of I don't know instead of having meaningless immediate opinions. This includes acknowledging your own errors and shortcomings as you move. Unfortunately, power can tend to cause people to become obsessed with control, with outcomes, and with achieving those outcomes through control. We'll talk more about that later. But first, we have to realize that situational humility is one way to describe this, but there's a deeper lurking thing that we have to cover first. So we have to talk about naive realism. Anybody know what this is? Okay, that's fun. No, this is a thing we don't hear about. I wanna ask you all a very simple question, all right? Is a hot dog a sandwich? Raise your hand and keep it up if you think a hot dog is a sandwich. Okay, now keep it up, like look around the room. Everybody look around the room. Okay, if you thought it was a sandwich, you have to go on this side. If you think it's not a sandwich, you go on that side and we're just gonna fight. We're just gonna fight this out right now. No, but this is a fairly simple question, right? And of course, immediately you're like, no, it's not. There's all these layers. I don't know. Really... It's a simple question. Is a hot dog a sandwich? You immediately have an instinct, a gut answer to that question. All right, you have a very clear answer to that question and a pretty strong belief behind it. But there are people in this very room who disagree with you. Why? Because the world is not aligned to what's going on inside of your skull. Naive realism is a thing where we assume that we, what we perceive in the world is the way the world is. And that's not true. And I don't even mean that in a very like philosophical sense of like, we can never know true truth, et cetera. I mean, literally, the way you perceive the world is different from other people. Let me prove it. As human beings, as we navigate through the world, we kind of collect samples, experiences, and we tuck those away in our autonomous self. They become part of our model of the world. All of these things, everything we experience as we go through the world as us becomes a part of us. And it shapes your expectations. When we talk about common sense, what we're talking about is this innate lump of accumulated experiences that we are carrying through the world that say, well, the world works like this because it has worked like this so far. What that actually does is it shapes how you collect samples. The experiences you have in the world are actually different because of the experiences you have had previously. This is confirmation bias. This is at the heart of confirmation bias. You see what you expect. What that means is that we as humans actually start diverging almost from birth. And we specialize. We become people that see the world differently, that engage with the world differently. And that's fantastic because a bunch of different people can really help you. I don't have to fit all possible views of the world into my own skull because I have other people that can help me do that. I mean, it's a good thing because I can't do that in the first place. And if you're sitting here going, oh, I don't know about this, let me prove it to you. Anybody remember this? 2015, the good times on the internet. <sighs> this was, has anybody not seen this? Okay, then I won't belabor the point. Right, the dress that was, was it blue or black, white or gold? Okay, well, for starters, we know the truth. It was a black and blue dress. That's from the online store that sells it. I don't know if they're still selling it. I think the, the fad has kind of decreased. Good Halloween costume for this idea year? I don't know. But... Here's the thing, that original image is so fascinating because it is a kind of like fulcrum. It's a point where a bunch of humans fell on one side of things and one bunch of humans fell on the other side of things. We perceive this image differently and we did it because of the way the human visual cortex works. 
This is a shot of the dress in both bright light and artificial light shadow. As you can see, it looks blue and or white and gold on this side and blue and black on this side. This is why we saw the dress as two different colors, because of the underlying or ambient information. Your brain tries to pick up information about what is the lighting, what is the, the environment that this dress is in, and use that to kind of color correct. And in this case, the ambient information was just weird enough that it broke half way in one way, or broke half one way and one half the other way. In fact, the fascinating thing about this is if you are what they call a night owl, a person who tends to stay up later and wake up later, who tends to work more in artificial light, you see the dress is black and blue. If you're a morning lark, a person that tends to wake up earlier and go to bed earlier and tends to enjoy a lot of natural light or engage with the world when there's more natural light, you see the dress as white and gold. You're more likely to anyway. Literally, your experiences in the world up to this point shaped how you saw the dress when you encountered it for the first time. And I mean that very literally. It changed how you saw it. That's what I mean when I say your experiences shape your perceptions. And so you need to practice inquiry. Naive realism makes us think we know what's going on in the world. It makes us fail to be curious. In some places, asking questions is seen as weak. Some places have what's called a culture of telling where you, leaders have to be strong. They have to have the opinion and have the authority. Questions can either help broaden understanding by asking, well, what else is true? What else could happen? What else is going on? Or they can help deepen understanding. Well, tell me why that's true. Can you tell me more about that? Why do you think so? Edmondson provides some rules for a good question. You kind of start out with, you don't know the answer. A thoughtful question does not start out with the answer embedded in it. If your boss asks you, hey, so that thing you're working on, that ticket, you're doing this this way, right? Every person in this room is gonna go, yes, boss, exactly. Because you bake the answer you want into the question. Don't do that. You've also, in that particular case, asked a question where the answer is yes or no, and you don't wanna do that either. You wanna ask open-ended questions. And lastly, you want to phrase the question in a way that helps others share their thinking in a focused way. So for instance, if you take that first question of, you know, you're doing this this way particularly, you can say, well, what methodology are you using to try and solve this problem? That's a way of framing the question that helps pull the answer th that you want, not like the left or right answer, but the type of answer that you want from that person. Julia Minson, who I'll be talking about later, talks about using elaboration questions. I'm curious why you believe that. Well, what makes you think that? You're trying to dig deeper and understand what's really going on with them, what they're really thinking. And lastly, when your people are asking questions, you want to express appreciation. To keep that culture of inquiry alive, you need to express appreciation when somebody takes the risk to ask a question. Remember, when they're asking a question, there's kind of an implicit, I don't understand, or maybe this isn't the right way, or hey, have you thought about this? They're taking a risk. It takes courage and energy to ask questions, and you need to appreciate that. So even if they're wrong, even if they're asking a question and you know that that isn't correct, so when somebody says, hey, I was trying to do this and I think we should do this this way, is that gonna be right? You first appreciate that they brought that thing to you. Say, thanks for that. Thank you for that suggestion. Let me think about it. Or thank you for that suggestion. But hey, what you don't see is there's this other thing over here and that's why this isn't gonna work. You express appreciation first and then you educate. Now, you might ask the question, is it possible to get psychological safety inside an environment that is absolutely not psychologically safe? And the answer is yeah. If you have a dumpster fire of a company you're working for, you can actually still build psychological safety inside of your particular team. Because remember, those things are climate driven. Now that's gonna take some energy to kind of keep those frogs from bouncing off, but it's possible. But unfortunately, psychological, why? Psychological safety is not going to be enough because uh, 
there's these pesky things that start creeping up all the time with humans. So we have to talk about how to deal with your emotions. There's a tendency, especially with engineers, especially with male engineers, to believe that controlling the emotions of other people is going to lead to better outcomes in conflict. Right? No. Just firm no on that one. When we take emotions and we stuff them into a bag, it doesn't make them go away. They're still there. We can't leave our affective experiences that we're going through in the world at the door of work and come in and just be like, yeah, I'm, you know, this is not severance, right? You can't do that. You and everything you're bringing still come to the table. The majority of developers are still not taught how to deal with emotions in a per like productive way. And it means that these things tend to run roughshod over the entire company. So we tend to stuff them down and that just leads to misplaced anger. So what do we do about that? Well, you could read this book. Um, I, I don't recommend it. It was a fantastic book. It's extremely dense. This is a uh, theory and practice by Argus and Schoen. And Argus and Schoen kind of break human interactions and conflict down into two different models, what they call model one and model two. Now, model one seeks to win in a zero sum game. If you're engaging in a conflict with another person, your goal is to win, to get what you want and for them not to get what they want. They want to control the emotions of the other participants in those conversations, in those conflicts. And they want to enact concrete strategies to achieve those outcomes. They want to do things that are going to squash the emotions of other people and get them what they want and not get you what they want or what you want. And model one leads to two things, self-fulfilling prophecies and self-sealing processes, according to Argus and Schoen. So to explain the difference between these two and what they are, I would like you to meet Sawyer and Morgan, because you might know what a self-fulfilling prophecy is, but we're going to go through it anyway. So Sawyer is a student and Morgan is Sawyer's teacher. So Sawyer's a student in Morgan's class and Morgan has been told, hey, Sawyer is a troublemaker. You should watch out for them. So they keep a pretty sharp eye for Sawyer stepping out of line. And what that means is that Sawyer feels as though they're being singled out unfairly because they are. And as a result, they tend to get angry at Morgan. So especially if you're dealing with a child, Sawyer might act out in an attempt to display their lack of respect, right? To demonstrate that, you know, you're not the boss of me, etc. That's just going to reinforce Morgan's opinion of Sawyer as a troublemaker. And now Morgan is kind of locked in this self-fulfilling prophecy, this vicious circle of belief, expectation, and behavior. So the difference between that, a self fulfilling prophecy versus a self-sealing prophecy, we're going to meet with Jordan and Taylor. Jordan is Taylor's boss. And Jordan, importantly, holds model one as their theory of interaction. So Jordan thinks that Taylor is incompetent at coding. That's their opinion. But they also believe they can't actually confront Taylor about that directly because Taylor will get upset. And remember, with model one, your goal is to turn around and diminish, to shrink, to squash the other people's emotions. So they can't have that conversation directly. So what they do is they don't have that conversation. They turn around and they just say, okay, well, I'm gonna try and get Taylor to become a QA by praising them anytime they do anything close to QA related and assigning them QA related tasks. Now, Taylor, on the other hand, is sitting there having doubts about the authenticity of all of this praise that is coming related to QA things. But they don't confront Jordan about it because they're afraid. They don't have psychological safety. And there's a very big risk of getting into a conflict about your boss or with your boss. So Taylor is now angry about Jordan's deception, justifiably so and they stubbornly refuse to move to QA. Now, Jordan is locked in a prison of their own making. They've created this world where unless they change their theory of action, they can't break out of it. 
as long as they believe they have to prevent Taylor from getting mad, they have no way of confronting Taylor about that particular their performance. They can't have that conversation. This is a self-sealing prophecy. Jordan has been sealed in by their own actions and by their beliefs. Model two, on the other hand, seeks to arrive at a win-win scenario, to arrive at a scenario where all parties benefit. It tries to accept and to understand the emotions of the other participants. And lastly, it attempts at all costs to avoid self-sealing processes, to keep the avenues of exploration and avenues of action open. And that's tough. It's tough to do because if you're afraid of conflict, if you're afraid of emotions, if you're afraid of losing, you kind of unconsciously gravitate toward model one. It just kind of sucks you in. And that creates self-fulfilling prophecies. People wind up more emotional the more you try to control them. And when you engage in conversations with people in model one, you do one of two things. You either try to angrily swat down incorrect opinions, or you turn around and use moral language to batter your opponents down. How could you think that? That's the absolute, you want the absolute worst for this project. Or in some cases, to turn around and do things like uh, say, hey, I'm experiencing this particular thing. It must be because you don't like me or you don't like my gender, you don't like my race, etc. Those things may not be true. They might be true, but they may not be true. And when you bring those things to the party first and foremost, you've escalated the conflict by using moral language. And it's a totally understandable impulse because what you're trying to do is use a sledgehammer. You don't like conflict and you want this conflict to go away fast. What's the best way to do that? Well, I'll just paint my opponent as this person who is absolutely terrible. And with, you know, when they're confronted with the full moral rectitude of my opinion, they will surely fold. I'm sure you can imagine how well that works because they are sitting over there thinking the same thing. So what do we do about that? Well, okay, we provide psychological safety and we prepare to get uncomfortable in our teams. That's what. We have to let those emotions out because they're part of who we are as humans. And you could drag them out into the open by offering explicit points to talk about them in retrospectives. Well, how do you feel about the work we just did? Are you proud of it? Or in postmortems. Well, after that outage that we just had, how did you feel about the circumstances before it? What about after? Were you angry? Were you upset? Were you afraid? If you're a leader, you can model emotional talk. Something like, uh, hey, we don't understand how the system works. And that scares me. I'm worried that we're going to wind up on the hook for a bunch of code that we didn't write and we, didn't, we don't understand. And we're, we're going to be held accountable for something we have no control over. That's an emotional statement. And you can model those as a leader on your team. You can go to therapy. That's you know, one option. Um, I don't mean that just like in the general sense, but therapy can be a good sort of preventative maintenance for this thing that can help you learn how to talk about your emotions and how to experience your emotions better. Even if it isn't something huge, even if you're not going through something where you're like, well, I better go to therapy. Therapy can be good. You can go for a couple months and stop. It's not like you're locked in forever. We also have to be aware of task conflict over time. Because task conflict has this nasty habit of becoming relationship conflict as it festers. If we're not being open and honest about the emotions we're experiencing with each other, we start replacing those emotions onto our coworkers. We start turning around and saying, well, this person is that, this person is this. Instead of thinking them as a human being who's experiencing things. If someone is getting antsy about feedback on their idea, say a junior dev in their you know, first couple peer reviews, it's probably because they haven't done the work to separate themselves from their work yet. That's an emotional process. 
that takes time and leadership to help them over. You are not your code. If you're hearing that for the first time, I'm sorry, but it's true. I mean, that should be freeing, right? Every one of us in the room should be like, yes, <laughs> I, all those sins, not my fault. Task conflict can become relationship conflict when it festers. Disagreements over concrete things can become an opinion of that other person is an asshole if they're not managed. So let's talk about how to prevent that conflict from spilling over. Julia Minson, who's done a bunch of research around this topic, uses a technique called conversational receptiveness. Because here's the thing, you can be as empathetic as you want. You can be as humble as you want. And neither of those things are actually visible to the other person in the conversation. They can't see it. And so they don't often have an effect. Now, if you're asking questions over a long period of time, being humble over a long period of time, that can matter. But a couple questions is not going to convey, I am taking you seriously. So what do we do about that? Well, Minson describes this technique called here. The first technique she uses is called hedging. When you're saying opinions, you want to use hedging words. Now, these are things we often cut out of our statements because they make them seem less strong, less strident, and less correct. Things like perhaps, sometimes, maybe, if. Hedge your opinions. Leave space for your opponent's opinions in the dialogue. The E is for emphasizing agreement. You want to find the points that you do agree on and say, great, well, we both agree on this, right? And have them nod. Because now you've created an emotional connection with that person. You've created a place to start from. You also want to use acknowledgement. You want to restate what they're saying. Use what's called active listening and respond to them with, so what I'm hearing you say is this is the thing, right? And I don't mean that with like, insert your favorite straw man here. So what you're saying is that all QA are terrible, right? No, what I'm saying is that maybe we should be giving our QA the same access to the tools that our devs have for self-improvement. Very different, but it's easy to see how you could get from one to the other. Lastly, the R, you wanna reframe to the positive. Take statements that we tend to talk about as negative. So for instance, I really hate it when people interrupt me. And reframe that to the positive. I love it when I get to finish the thought that's in my head. You've reduced the emphasis on combat in that script, like by doing that. You've helped create a collaborative environment where both of you can get what you want. That's that model too. But obviously we don't just bring our emotions to the table. When we engage in conflict, we are in the whole big bad mess of ourself and all of that just right on the table. Our tendencies, whether those are innate or learned, all of the things of who we are, shape how we approach conflict in various ways. So let's talk about confrontational styles. Confrontational styles kind of exist in this matrix, right? There are five of them. This is called the dual concern model of confrontational styles. So on the Y axis, you have concern for others' outcomes. And on the X axis, you have concern for your outcome. We're gonna go through each of these in turn. So let's talk about avoiding first. Now in this one, you have low concern for your outcome and low concern for the other person's outcome. So it's a strictly passive approach. You're basically hoping that problems solve themselves. And rather than discussing conflict, you're changing the subject, skipping the meetings, or leaving the group altogether. This is that defensive avoidance that I talked about. This is the thing you do when you're absolutely not sure about your status in the group, absolutely not sure about your ability to engage, and you have zero psychological safety. The next style is yielding. This is a passive pro-social approach. In this case, you have more concern for the opponent's outcomes than your own. You're basically giving way, attempting to placate the other person effectively by giving them what they want and not getting what you want. It tends to solve both large and small conflicts by simply giving into other people's demands. That could be either genuine conversion, you could actually believe it and change, or it could be just compliance. 
and it's actually a little bit not sure which is going to be, or those can get twisted rather, because sometimes you turn around and say, well, okay, I'm just going to give them what they want. And then your brain has to ask yourself the question, why did I do that? And the answer to it, well, I must believe what they say at least a little bit. That can actually shift your opinions. That's a whole different talk, sorry. <laughs> There's fighting, and fighting is the active pro-self approach. I care about my goals and not the other person's. It uses competitive, powerful tactics to intimidate. It uses mandates, challenge, arguing, insults, accusing, complaining, vengeance, even physical violence. This is model one in a nutshell. You're in there to win, you're in there to control, you're in there to end this. There's cooperating, and cooperating is the active pro-social and pro-self approach. Cooperating is not yielding. You're in there trying to get a win-win for both of you, identifying the issues underlying that dispute and working to identify a solution for both. You're trying to get each person to consider the other person's outcomes. This is model two. Lastly, there's conciliating, which is kind of this weird mixed approach of attempting to win over by accepting some demands, but not all. There are some psychologists who don't even think this actually exists. They think it's just kind of hot switching between yielding and uh, fighting, but we are including it for completion's sake. You need to know what confrontational style you're coming to the table with. And that can actually change based on the group you're interacting with. If you have a high social status in one group, you might engage very differently than a group where you don't have a high social status, where people don't look up to you. That's totally natural. You have to think about what the norms of the group are too. Are people in this group tending to engage in a fighting strategy or a conciliatory strategy? Power is going to affect how you shit, like what technique you use as well. Again, that social status is power. And the more of it you have, the more you're going to tend toward that model one fighting approach because you feel like you have to protect it. You want to keep an eye out for the styles of others in your groups. Pay attention to what they tend to use and what that style implies about their goals. And that can be tough if you have a coworker that tends to use a yielding strategy. Getting their actual opinion out of them can take a long time because they will just fold instantly. Yeah, whatever, that's okay. Well, I didn't really care about that that much anyway. No, what is your actual opinion here? I want to have a conflict with you, really. And these people are trying to duck out of conflict constantly. But that's going to take you convincing them that it's safe to do it by fostering that psychological safety. You and your team have a shared goal together. You want to build good software together. At least I really hope you do. I really hope that is a goal. So you have something in common already. And you have a place to start from. Again, going back to Minson's here, you have a place of agreement. We agree that we want the best for this team, right? How many people have heard that principle of agile, that um, what they are, the principle of retrospectives, like assume everyone has done their best work, right? If you haven't heard it, that's a thing. Um, you want to assume that everybody has done the best they can in that time during the previous sprint. In the same way, you want to assume that everybody on the team has that shared goal. And then you want to make it explicit and say, do we have this shared goal? Because if not, you have a bigger conversation coming. Okay, so all of this is great if you're a team lead, you're a manager or whatever. Um, but how, you know, if you're just a regular plebe, how do you deal with this? What do you do with any of this information? Well, let's talk about it. Let's handle conflict as an individual contributor, okay? First, I want you to know that you are not as powerless as you think you are. The actions of a single individual can change the norms of a group. I have research to back it up. The trick here 
is you want to remain a member in good standing of the group. The second you say loudly and longly enough that you are all screwing this up, you're now an outsider and they have no reason to listen to you. So what you want to do is this trick where you preface dissent with conformity. Again, it goes back to that expressing agreement. Find the things you agree with and say, I think we agree on this. And I believe in this as much as you. But then you express your thought. You want to continually reiterate the fact, not to the, you know, to the point that it's obvious, but you want to keep reinforcing the fact that you are one of the group. You are one of the members. And you want to be aware of power dynamics in the situation because power is problematic, right? Uh, not to pull the old quote, but you know, power corrupts. That trope, that phrase is stuck around because there's a real nugget of truth in it. Power can make you look at people with less power as problems to be solved. That's part of what leads to that model one mindset. A lack of power can change what conflicts you can shift in any meaningful way. There might be conflicts that you look at and you say, I can't engage with that because I know I'm going to lose. Power makes people feel like conflict threatens their status. What that means is if you want to have a conflict with somebody who has a high social status, maybe start out in private because then you're not threatening their social status as much. They don't feel like they have to demonstrate and act out to you know, retain control of the situation, to retain their status in the group. You wanna to try to engage with model two as much as you can, but that is gonna require that the other person play ball. So you have to be aware when somebody is coming at you with model one. Pay attention to it and say, okay, this is not a thing that I'm going to enjoy. Power, again, can make this more likely. In that moment, you have kind of have to decide, is this conflict worth it or not? It is entirely valid to look at a piece of conflict and just go, you know what? It's not worth it for me to engage. I'm going to choose yielding and just nope out of the situation because it's not worth the effort, it's not worth the potential psychological or relationship damage. Again, having psychological safety can help reduce the likelihood of somebody noping out. And you want them to do that because again, we are all different human beings with different perspectives from birth. And you need those perspectives. You need people bringing those forward. It can also help if you're an individual contributor to know the difference between goals and positions. Now, a goal is what somebody wants out of a conflict. This is the thing they want and they ultimately want to achieve it. A position is how they envision getting there because a human being doesn't just come up with a goal. We always go, okay, well, this is that. And then how do I get from point A to point B? Okay, done. We have a solutions in our head, especially if you're of an engineering stripe because that's our job. Problem, solution, problem, solution, problem. Like that's what we do all day. It is infinitely easier to shift positions than it is goals. You can rarely shift their goals, but you can shift their positions so it overlaps with your goal as well. There's a really good book called uh, Thanks for the Feedback. And they talk about, um, by, it's by Douglas Stone and Sheila Heen. They talk about um, this, I think it's a hypothetical example. I don't know if it's actually real, but a uh, social worker and I think his name was Gus, but Gus looked like he was an extra for the Grateful Dead. Um, like he played banjo, wore sandals at work, like dungarees, like a striped shirt, long bushy beard. Like he looked like Guy Royce, except if Guy Royce played banjo. Um, and this was putting some of his clients off. And so his boss comes in and is like, you got Gus, you got to shave the beard. That was his boss's position. His boss's goal was to not make his clients scared anymore. And so through the course of this conversation, what they actually figure out is they can have a position that achieves both their goals. Gus keeps the beard, boss says the clients don't get scared anymore. But Gus and his boss agreed 
to basically tell them, like, before you meet Gus, here's a little bit about Gus. Gus plays in a bluegrass band. Gus is this. And they basically set the expectation for these people before they met Gus. And then it was fine if you knew what you expected, because Gus did not look like your average social worker. They both achieved what they wanted. They both got their goals because they found a position that achieved both of them. You could also just find goals you share in the first place or could share, ones you could adopt. I don't want you to think that any of those particular strategies of conflict is not useful. Again, sometimes you might want to choose yielding because you want to particularly engage in conflict in a different area and you don't want to spend that social capital. Being the person who consistently and constantly engages in conflict on a team is another way to start testing yourself as the outsider. Because humans look at that and go, well, you're the person slowing us down. Why do we always have to have the conversation? So you have to find out what you care about. People with differing amounts of power than you in an organization often have differing goals. In fact, almost certainly have different goals. They not only have the status kind of goals that we talked about, but they often have broader goals about the company. This particular division needs to achieve these metrics. This particular th product needs to achieve these things. Things that you might not have the scope or the visibility into. If you can't pick your style of conflict, you have to pick your conflicts carefully. You might actually be dealing with multiple conflicts at the same time. Or additional struggles that come from your demographics, who you are. You can also pull in other team members, all right? Now, this is something that I think a lot of people also lean on fairly quickly. Well, okay, well, let's get Sally in here because she thinks I'm right. You can do that and it can work. The other person will absolutely understand that this is a power play. You are trading on your power in the group to make your argument for you. Again, it can work, but it's not always going to work the way you want. And it can have lasting effects on the relationship with that other person. I hate this book. Um, I will go on at length about it if you allow me to, but this is from the seven habits of highly effective individuals. I hate this book. I love this habit. All right. Seek first to understand your job as an individual, as anybody participating in a conflict is to try to understand what the other person actually wants. What is their goal? Not just their position. What is their opinion? What are their actual thoughts? Be curious, explore your collaborators' reasonings and their assumptions. This helps you find those goals and positions. So, all right, let's review. There's more than one type of conflict and they're not all bad. In fact, a bunch of them are really powerful and useful. Psychological safety enables us to surface hidden conflict and to engage with it. Emotions are going to happen in conflict and you cannot stop them. Trying to control them using model one methods uses, creates self-sealing processes that lock us in to a world that we don't want to exist. You can offer explicit moments to talk about emotions and model talking about emotions yourself. Recognizing the participation or the confrontational style of others in the participants can help you adjust your strategies or withdraw. As an individual, you can be aware of power dynamics, seek overlaps in goals or positions that fulfill almost most or all of the goals, and pick your conflicts very carefully. Conflict doesn't always have to be a Lord of the Flies situation, all right? It can be something that can help you build your team, build your relationships, lead us to a place where we can work better together, where we build better things that help make the world a better place things that we can be proud of and teams that we can be proud of. Thank you very much for listening. Um, if you have questions or comments, uh, I'll be up here or you can catch me actually at the Aperture booth. Um, I have some stickers up here in a bag. I didn't spread them out, sorry. If you're interested, I draw all the slides. So some stickers from stuff on the slides. But thanks again for listening and thank you for coming.